The reading today is from Rabia, and it's a poem called In My Soul. In my soul there is a temple, a shrine, a mosque, a church where I kneel. Prayer should bring us to an altar where no walls or names exist. Is there not a region of love where sovereignty is illumined? Nothing where ecstasy gets poured into itself and becomes lost, where the wing is fully alive but has no body or mind? In my soul, there is a temple, a shrine, a mosque, a church that dissolve, that dissolve in God. So it is. All right. You ready? <sighs> You've often heard me say that life is good. Life is good. And 99.9% .9 of the time, when I say life is good, I mean life is existentially good. It's good to be alive. Life itself as an expression is good. God is good. Life is good because life is an expression of God. Therefore, life is good. That's what I mean. Life is good. In the midst of all this chaos and ups and downs and expressions and expansions and contractions, life, that's what I almost always mean but not today. <laughs> this is that 0.1% where I say to you, life is often good. <laughs> and what I mean is life is often pleasurable. There are so many things in life that bring us pleasure. I just had a cup of coffee earlier. Oh, I like coffee. In fact, every morning from now on, you're going to come to my house. Both of you can come. It's fine. And while I drink my coffee, you're going to sing that song. <laughs> so I can just get, I want to get in the coffee, you know, like in the morning where you have nothing and you're like 5 a.m. and like, what am I doing with my choices? And then you're like, but at least I have coffee. Eat in the coffee or drown in the coffee or you just want to be in the coffee. Coffee's good. Coffee is pleasurable. Candy. I like candy. Like a kid. I want candy. I met Ariel's daughter and she says she wants to go next door. She doesn't want to hear me talk because she wants candy. It's like, hey, you coming in to live? They said, no, I want candy. So candy's good. Candy is pleasurable. A hug. A hug. I don't know if you like that whole portion of the service where you have to hug everyone, especially if you're kind of like, <laughs> the coronavirus. <laughs> so you don't see people, you see germs like all over their face. Like, hey, it's been a welcome. It's been a welcome, friend. Come and you're just like, oh. Yeah, me oh. Yeah. oh. <laughs> see, I like a hug. A hug is pleasurable. It brings me pleasure. There are so many things in life that bring us pleasure. And of course, on the other end, there are so many things in life that bring us pain. But today, we're going to bathe in the pleasure. All these wonderful things us to feel so good. Did you know that pleasure is three-dimensional? You didn't? Well, good. That's why I'm here to teach you. We often think of pleasure in only one dimension. We think of pleasure as physical, meaning I do something that makes me feel good. My body's always changing. My body's always moving. My body's always reacting to its environment. So when the environment changes and my body changes, it can be pleasurable. The shift can be pleasurable. You're really hot and you walk out and a breeze hits you and you're like, oh, pleasure. The coffee, the way it tastes, the way it warms me, pleasure. A hug from a big man is pleasurable. 
a good book, the way the words look. I mean, I, I like the content of books, but I like the way the words look. I like the way the paper feels. This is physical pleasure because our body is changing and our mind is going, yes, that is beneficial. So yes, pleasure is a physical thing. Pleasure is something we feel in the body and we do so many things and engage in so many tasks that are physically pleasurable. But that is only one of the dimensions of pleasure. There's more to it. You can hug someone, my man, you can hug someone and feel physical pleasure, but something in the background, something in the distance, and this is not you, this is not you, something in the distance is off. I feel pain somewhere else. Because pleasure is not just physical, pleasure is also emotional. And I can feel physical pleasure and emotional pain at the exact same time. I can feel pleasure in my body and pain down deep in my emotional body. Because just like our physical body is always shifting and changing, underneath the surface there's a whole pile of energy that also constantly shifting and changing. Close your eyes. Go ahead. I'm not going to sneak up behind you and hug you. Close your eyes. Put your arms out. Where does your body stop? Where does your body begin? Does your body stop at the tips? Or is there something beyond? Does your body begin at the fingertips? Or is there something more? Something moving, something shifting, something vibrating within and beyond those fingers. Where do you begin? And where do you end? Open your eyes. What I'm talking about is energy. This physical body of yours it's just an expression of energy constantly shifting, constantly moving. I like the iceberg experiment where you look at an iceberg and you see the tip that protrudes out of the water. That's your body. That's your physical body. But most of your body, most of it is underneath the surface, and that is the energy that is, is expressing itself in a physical form. And we can feel emotional pleasure. Someone, I can feel connected, I can feel physical pleasure, but deep down inside there's something that's shifting in me that says, no, this is not comfortable, this is not good. Most forms of addiction are one-dimensional. When we chase pleasure one-dimensionally and we're feeling pain at the surface, we're chasing it, we're chasing it, we're chasing it, trying to fill that void. Because pleasure rises and falls, rises and falls. And as long as you're chasing physical pleasure in its one dimension, it's never going to be enough. And when it falls, you will chase the rise again. So pleasure is not just physical, it's also emotional. It's also energetic. And the shifts and changes in these bodies are always moving and always shifting, and activities cause them to move and cause them to shift. So that's the second dimension of pleasure. We can have emotional pleasure and physical pain. We can have physical pleasure and emotional pain. And they are constantly interacting with one another. Which brings us to the third dimension. What do you think it is? No, we're not there. Spirituality? No. no. Mind. Almost. Mind! Who said mind? Oh, good. So, <laughs> <laughs> pleasure's in three dimensions. And pleasure is also mental. I can experience deep physical pleasure. I can experience deep emotional pleasure, and I could be screaming in here. I can do something that brings me pleasure. I can do something that makes my emotions feel good, that makes my emotions and my energy shift in a positive way, but my mind can be fighting it off. My mind can be screaming. My mind can be saying, don't do this anymore. We 
we, we are not okay with this. When I talk about psychological pleasure, I mean the atmosphere of your mind. Let's pretend for a moment that your mind is the sky. And as you know, the sky is hardly ever empty. White, beautiful, fluffy clouds. Pleasure. Sounds good, pleasure. This feels good, pleasure. Dark, drifting, storm clouds, pain, rain, sunshine, rain, sunshine, rain. We have a constantly shifting mental atmosphere, just like we have a constantly shifting physical body. And psychological pain is just the mental atmosphere. It's just what the weather looks like for you today. So I can experience physical pleasure, deep emotional pleasure. I can connect, I can hug, I can read, I can eat. I can eat, and I can eat, and I can eat. So physically pleasurable, and I can eat more and more, and emotionally it begins to shift, but my mind is like, stop. Stop trying to fill that void. We've mentioned addiction very briefly. I don't want to get into that too much today, but addiction has to do with one-dimensional pleasure where the mind is telling you to stop. The mind is screaming. The mind is in turmoil. And if you notice, each of these is deeper. It's easy physical pleasure. Does that feel good? Yeah, it feels good. Does that feel good? Yeah, that feels good. It's a little bit more difficult to discern emotional pleasure. Does that feel good? Yeah, that... That feels good. Does that feel bad? Well, how do you feel? Does that feel bad? When you start talking about the mind, the mind can play tricks. How do I discern my mental atmosphere? How do I know when I'm in psychological pain when it feels so good? How can I hate something so much when it feels so good? How can I be emotionally connected to someone when my mind is saying, no, that doesn't work? So we chase it as human beings. We chase pleasure. We chase pleasure. We try to get as much of it as possible. We want the pleasure senses to rise, and we want to sustain them. But we're looking for it in one dimension. We're not looking for it in all three dimensions. The only type of pleasure that is fulfilling is three-dimensional pleasure. The only type of pleasure that will fulfill you is pleasure that hits all categories, where your body, spirit, mind, I said spirit, oh, I'm getting, jumping ahead, oh. where body, emotion, and mind is all in accord and all saying, yes, this is good. It's going to fall again because pleasure rises and falls, but you're in it fully. Which brings us to our topic. There's certain things that feel good in life. Cookies, candy, coffee, hugs. But there's one thing that feels really good. And you may tell your children, no, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. (laughs) You may tell them, you know, that that thing that they talk about in school, you know, there's so much to smell the flowers, you know. Go out out for a walk. Take a cold. more pleasurable than any other thing we can experience. And yes, I'm talking about the three-letter word, sex. Sex is wonderful, extremely physically pleasurable. You know why? Have you ever wondered why sex is so awesome? This is how they should teach. First of all, before we get into the particulars of how your body works, I want to tell you this thing we're talking about is awesome. (laughs) If you doing it right it's awesome do you know why it's awesome because you're enacting the creation of life (laughs) evolution has made sex the best thing ever because evolution wants to create that's what it does that's what that's one priority create more life life creates life and when you're engaged in this thing we call sexual intercourse you are enacting the of life. You're enacting the actual explosion of atoms, creating new things. 
That's why it feels so good. But most of us are chasing sex in one dimension because it's so physically good, we're ignoring the other two dimensions of sexuality and we run to rye. We go from guy to guy, from girl to girl, from guy, from girl to girl, from moment to moment, wondering why we're so empty inside when it felt so damn good last night. It felt great last night, but now, you know, I got a big day ahead. And, you know, I just, I got so much to do and, you know, just, you know, you're fine. I'm just going to hit the shower and, you know, just this, this. Put your stuff on the chair. <laughs> Never happened to me. I was actually this one. I was actually this one. What? I thought, I thought we were going to talk. <laughs> but we, I mean, it's, it's funny. This is funny because it's a cliche, and it's a cliche because it happens over and over and over and over again. You chase the physical rise of sexual pleasure and wonder why when the rise falls, you're like, empty inside. Why did I do that? Why did I give my physical self away and I am not fulfilled? I guess I'll just do more of it. Because that's what pleasure is like. Just keep the rise going. I'm just trying to get a rise out of you. Just keep it going. More, 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 more. So we're having sex in one dimension. We're having physical sex, seeking physical pleasure, and we're forgetting that sex and physicality and pleasure has more to it. We're missing the other dimensions. Do you know how to have emotional sex? Has anyone actually ever told you that? In health class, when they're saying with the thing, you have my slides? When they show you how it works, and then they show you pictures of diseases, and say, don't get these, they're never telling you that, oh, by the way, when you look to connect with someone, connect emotionally. Be emotionally vulnerable. Be satisfied emotionally. In order to have good sex, I don't know why I'm not just doing that. <laughs> I'm sorry. In order to have good sex, you've got to connect physically. You have to be physically attracted to someone. You can't choose to be physically attracted to someone no matter who tells you you can. You're just drawn to them physically. There has to be a physical union. There has to be a physical connection. There has to be a touch that's electric. But there has to be a connection emotionally as well. Your energetic bodies have to match up. You have to be with someone you can be open to and vulnerable on an emotional level. And guess what? I know you don't want to hear it, but that takes a little more time. <laughs> Not this. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Nope. You're fine. Dating apps. Are we all too old for dating apps? You know? <laughs> What's he doing? What's that mean? Bumble. Nope, nope, nope. Nope, nope, nope. You can be attracted right away. You can physically connect right away. You can have hot physical sex on the first night. You cannot have hot emotional sex on the first night. I'm sorry, you can't. It takes time to be emotionally vulnerable. It takes time to not tighten that energy up when you're around someone. It takes time to feel comfortable enough to open up emotionally and say, yes, I'm not just giving you body. I am giving you my emotional body. I am allowing my energy to be present with you so that we can have a physical and emotional moment. Sex is more than just bodies bumping and grinding. Sex is emotions bumping and grinding. <laughs> Sex is about connection. It's about vulnerability. And if you're not doing it on these levels, you're not going to get anything from it. So yes, sex is physically wonderful. Physically wonderful. But it has to be emotionally wonderful. And to connect emotionally, you have to be vulnerable. You have to open up and be comfortable with someone just laying there. You have to be comfortable, and that takes time. But not as much time as it takes to have psychological sex. It can take years. Oh, oh what? <laughs> How long were you married? It takes, it can take, 
It can take 50 years to have sex psychologically. I mean, it takes time emotionally as well to be vulnerable and comfortable some, with someone. But when, when you're getting up here, one thing only. We're talking about trust. Do I trust you? Not do I accept you. Well, that's part of it. But do I trust you with every piece of me? It's an unfolding that happens over years and years. You wonder why monogamy is such a powerful human institution? Because it takes time to really get to know someone. It takes time to really unite with someone, to get all the crap out of the way to, until you're left with just union. Psychological sex is all about trust. It's all about being available to someone and allowing them to be available to you. If you're not having sex in these three dimensions, you ain't having sex. You're not really getting the full brunt of it. Because, yes, you have to be physically attracted, but you also have to be emotionally vulnerable and psychologically you have to trust them. And this is the work of a lifetime, but it's worth it. It is worth it because it's the best avenue we have to get back to where we began. You know the Greeks? I know the Greeks. They have this wonderful mythology. It says that in the beginning... God's created this super creature. Four arms, four legs, two heads, can mate with itself, could create life. Just happy. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> I don't want to get out of bed. Everything's good. Everything's good. But the gods became jealous because the gods are like, just, that's too perfect. So they got the sacred thread and they walked around. Shh. slicing them in half. And we have spent the rest of our lives looking for our other half, looking to reunite, looking to rekindle, looking for, looking to be with that person. And sex is an expression of that. But it has to exist in every single dimension. It has to exist physically, it has to exist emotionally, and it has to exist psychologically. And it takes time, and it takes patience, it takes work. You know what the crazy thing is? You know what's crazy? We've been talking, we've been talking for a while, and I haven't even mentioned God yet. You wanted me to earlier. So where is the sacred dimension of sexuality? If we're talking about sex and the sacred, where does God come into play? Because if I'm physically present, if I'm emotionally present, if I'm psychologically present, I don't need the sacred. I don't need God because I'm already fully available. Eh. Wrong. Do you know what sacred is? Do you know what sacred is? And how to get there, how to open up the fourth dimension to the lived experience. Because, of course, I'm not talking just about sex. I like to talk about sex, because it's fun to say sex. But I'm talking about life. You can eat a bowl of rice physically, emotionally, and psychologically. You can chop wood and carry water. Little Buddha, little Buddha. You can chop wood and carry water physically, emotionally, and psychologically. You can study, you can sleep, you can work, you can play, you can listen. And there's a word for it, it's called mindfulness. Being available to life. When I sit down to eat, do I sit down to eat like this? How many of you eat like that? <laughs> well, thank you for your honesty. The rest of us don't. 
people and you're just yes don't just eat watch tv read a book read the paper do your homework do it all at once how much can you get done in a single instant get more 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 brushing your teeth shower while listening to the radio on the phone <laughs> i'll be a little late this morning facetime me that's how we live our lives Guess what? To tie it back together, baby, that's how we have sex. We're there physically, but we're not there emotionally and we're not there mentally. What do I got to do tomorrow? What do I got to do later? Taxes. Oh, my God. <laughs> I hope it's not as bad as that. But as bad as, as bad as that up here and as bad as that in here, if you want to open up the fourth dimension of life, which can't be opened, by the way, there is no actual door. You cannot bring God into anything because what? Well, I guess I'm done. You've trained them well because God's not here. That's right. That's right. No, you're right because you're already here. Like, bring God. Like, let's, let's open the windows and let some God in. No, God is present in every single moment. Therefore, every single moment is already sacred. To stop doing all the shit and pay attention. (laughs) Especially sexuality. Everything I've said about presence, physical presence, being physically, that's easy because you're already there. Okay, let's get this done. But you need to be present emotionally in an inner body. You need to say, I'm here physically. I'm here with you emotionally. I am present to you emotionally. I'm allowing my energy to be a part of your energy. Yes, I am here in the moment with you. I am vulnerable to you. Be with me now. I am all yours. You are all mine. We are all ours. And yes, you have to be there here. You have to be there here. And this is the hardest thing to train to be here now. Ram Dass wrote a book about it. Be here now. He wrote the book like 40 years ago, and we still ain't figured it out yet. <laughs> Be here now. Where are you? Here. 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 When is it? Now. Damn right. <laughs> so be here. Be available. Do one thing at a time. And when you do that, when you give all of yourself physically, emotionally, and psychologically, when you give all yourself to any activity, all of a sudden, <laughs> that's the door opening. I said there was no door. It's a paradox. That's a paradox. <laughs> All of a sudden, there you are. There's the bowl of rice, and there's God. All because you paid attention. Opening up the sacred fourth dimension of life is just about presence. It's about being where you are physically, emotionally, and mentally. It's about being present, and yes, it's the work of a to be physically where you want to be, to emotionally be vulnerable to the moment, even if it's not pleasurable, and to be psychologically present, to trust what is, and the deeper part of that, to have faith in what is. Because faith is just the spiritual undergirding of trust. This is what is, and I am here, and I am present with you, and because I am here, and I am present with you, God is with us. God was with us before, but now I'm here enough to start to see that. To open up the sacred dimension of sexuality is just to be present. And I'm so sorry, you can't be present with everyone. Uh, I'm sorry. You can be physically attracted, but not emotionally attracted. You can be emotionally attracted, but not trust. It's a human thing. And I know you want to. I want to be vulgar. I want to be vulgar. I know you want to screw everyone. But you can't. Then you don't. Look at you. <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> but if it's not happening in all dimensions, if it's not moving toward all dimensions, if you're not moving in that direction, you're never going to get it. Reminds me of that commercial. People out there getting it, but what are they getting from it? They ain't getting nothing because they're not available. And being available takes time. Kids in the room, kids in the room, kids in the room, kids in the room, kids in the room. <laughs> Talking about S-E-X. I'm just kidding. You have to be present fully, and only when you're present fully is that magic going to happen. 
It'll start with the attraction. And through that physical attraction, you'll begin to open up emotionally slowly over time. And as you open up emotionally slowly over time, you'll begin slowly to trust that person. And you might wake up 30 or 50 years down the road and say, wow, that's the first time we've had sex. And man, life. So yes, it's sacred sexuality, but it's really sacred life. How do I live a sacred life? What do I do? How do I live a sacred life? And yes, how do I have sex in a sacred way? One rule, show up. If you're not able to show up, walk away. If you're not able to show up, walk away. Tell your kids that. When it stirs inside you, young woman or young man, If you're not able to be present, if any part of you is trying to get out of the room, get out of the room. It's that easy. Show up. Show up. And when you show up, guess who shows up? God. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. Now go out and get you some. Life. Go out and give some life. See, now that I'm done talking, it's just getting awkward. <laughs>